Right, I'm going to read the paper by Javerio um, Balesta from the Universidad um, de Valencia. Um, some major Celtic details on the origins of Indo-European languages. Going into detail, a brief, me brief methodologic methodological note. In recent times, diachronic, uh, diachronic linguistics have begun to take into account the significance of sound consistency with a few concrete details in order to validate a theory which is both abstract and large. Things were different in proto-historic lingu linguistics during the 19th and 20th centuries. When scholars used to proceed from top to bottom, from the ensemblist concept to the detailed point, in a deductive way of reasoning. Concerning the origins of non-historical languages, a standard procedure was to propose generically a macro theory based on analogies, but quite often very disputable and necessarily anachronistic analogies, with the well-documented origins of historical languages. The most conspicuous example of these practices is probably the traditional and mainstream theory on the origin of the Indo-European languages. According to this mega theory, the presence of Indo-European languages in Europa and in a significant part of Asia was essentially due to a super invasion of Indo-European people during the end of the Neolithic period and primarily as a result of their military supremacy. Obviously, the first problem that one must assume, must assume to evaluate mega theories of this kind is their, let's say, economic aspect, since their approval or rejection implies testing a big amount of archaeological, genetic, geographic, historical, or linguistic data. Another question is the relevance of the subject being studied. Some points can be crucial to encourage us to accept or dismiss the emerging theory, and others can be completely irrelevant to the verdict. For example, even if we could demonstrate that Latin was already spoken at, at a thousand years BC in Latium, this piece of evidence would have no major consequences for the mainstream theory on the origins of Indo-European languages. Conversely, conversely, if we could demonstrate that Latin was spoken, for example, at 10,000 years BC, let's say in the Canary Islands, this new piece of information, if ascertained, would immediately endorse our firm rejection of the old theory, since the new data would be wholly incompatible with the dates and places defended by the traditional theory. Seeking the red lines of the theory. So I'm just going to advance. I'm not quite sure on to the um, on the timing. Uh -huh. So fortunately, all theories have their own red lines or red lights, limits that you cannot cross. If one does, it means that the theory is not well founded. On the other hand. Unfortunately, too, healthy theories have two concomitant qualities, predictivity and productivity. That is, they must somehow foresee, predictivity, results or data that only further investigation will confirm or refute. Since theories necessarily try to cast light on dark aspects of the reality. At the same time, since mega theories involve a constellation of data, their explanatory capacity must be valid for the majority, that is productivity, and not only for a minority. Naturally, a theory can be considered uh, in erroneous or even false if its, predict if its predictions mostly fail or if its productivity is scarce. Incidentally, let us comment that an odd trait of the mainstream Indo-European linguistics has traditionally been the very low level of its predictive power. Due to the unexpectedness either of place or of time, or because of both, the discovery of archaic Indo-European languages in Anatolia, the discovery of Mycenaean Greek, just a mere specimen of Old Greek in Crete, or the discovery of a centum language as Tocharian in the far wild east became completely unforeseen surprises in the frame of traditional theory. So I'm just trying to advance this. Um, where we go? Oh, oh that's probably the. Uh, he's probably got clapping here, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why we had a sound thing. 
Oh no, that's the end. That's too early. I might have advanced too fast here, so I was. I have. It's jumped ahead. Not quite sure how I did that. I pressed it too often. You do now. <laughs> that's where we are. I was getting impatient with it. So one of the decisive battles, the Celtic conundrum. So let's abandon the wide and blurred oceanic horizons for a while to focus our mind on the sharply defined skylines of small islands. A question still open to debate is the unresolved Celtic conundrum. That is, the origins of the Celtic-speaking people. The traditional theory postulates that the compact presence of Celtic languages in the extreme west of Europe was also due to an invasion of Celtic people from Central Europe during the first millennium BC. Identifying the origin of a language from an invasion and subsequent colonizations or linguistic expansions does not entail too much risk. In this case, for example, we have real and historical documentation of Celtic languages in Western Europe on one side. Celtiberian in Spain, Gaulish in ancient Gaul, Irish, Welsh and Scots in the British Isles, etc. On the other side, in Central Europe, we find several cultural elements, for exa example, pottery or some other artefacts, that, was, that were more or less uh, coetaneous and s similar to those uh, found amongst the, the Western Celts. So that one can allegedly propose that Western Celts arrived from Central Europe, Central Europe around that time. However, a mass of problematic questions soon started to rise. A major problem, for example, was that scholars could find no evidence, no proof, no sign, or even trace of a Celtic invasion in the British Isles. As to continental Western Europe, the traces were also quite disputable. While conversely, eastward expansions of, uh, sorry, eastward invasions of Celtic people, more precisely, Gauls were perfectly recorded by ancient writers in Roman times. Wars used to have decisive battles, and as shown by the Indo-European puzzle, the origin of the Celts is a clear example of this. Historically, Celtic-speaking people occupy a very peripheral location in pure ge geographic terms, since they mostly settled in the extreme western zone of the Indo-European domain. They could only reach their historical headquarters in very recent times, according to traditional theory, because the further you go, the later you arrive and Celtic tribes supposedly come from an ancestral Indo-European Urheimat, far, far away. Sorry? Do I need to? I think so. Oh, I do. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'm just checking to see... Um, Yeah, that's the next one, sorry. Hang on. Just to recap. Um, they could only reach their historical headquarters in very recent times, according to traditional theory, because the further you go, the later you arrive. And Celtic tribes supposedly come from an ancestral Indo-European Urheimat, far, far away. Therefore, an old date for Celtic-speaking people in the western fringes of Europe can be a crucial argument against traditional scenario. Given that a very recent date, Neolithic or Epineolithic age, for Indo-European diaspora represents one of those red lines, no trespassing of the theory. So Alinay in 2000 accurately describes the Celts as the main victims of traditional theory, since they were compelled to appear in their historical homeland right at the last moment, when all the other Indo-European tribes had already occupied their own respective historical territories. They were simply the late last comers. But this view collides head on with several little, albeit firmly fixed, facts. One is the linguistic th history of the Isle of Man. As, is, as, as Aline and Bonozzo point out, the small British island, historical home of the Manx, an ancient Celtic language, provides archaeological traits that allow us to observe a stable cultural and also genetic continuity from its first settlement in the Mesolithic era. During millennia, we have no proof of the language spoken on the island, but from the earliest testimonies of the 20th century, when Manx was no longer spoken, everything suggests that 
that there the dominant and established language was one of Celtic type. Thus, in the context of stable cultural continuity, to hypothesize that a language of a stock any other than Celtoid was ever spoken in the island is, at best, the least economic and probable hypothesis. However, there is now a wealth of information supporting continuity since the preceding Paleolithic and Mesolithic periods, revealing a slow and gradual adoption of Neolithic elements by local indigenous populations. This is especially true for Atlantic Europe, the very same area that becomes populated with megaliths during the subsequent uh, Neolithic and Bronze Ages. Indeed, if from the archaeological point of view there is no evidence of any foreign invasion, no evidence of any interruption, neither during the first millennium BC nor before or later until modern times, if we only find cultural and population continuity on the island, the real question at issue is when and how that people started to speak a Celtic language. No more questions, Your Honour. Sorry. And now let us introduce a smaller detail, inasmuch since we are going to speak about an island even smaller. As we wrote some years ago, from a review by Paul Galoni, we knew of the sensational discovery by the archaeologist Steve Mighton in a Scottish island of the Hebrides, specifically in Colonsay, a Gaelic word meaning hazelnut. The excavations that were carried out showed that indeed Colonsay had hazelnuts, but only between the years 8,000 and 5,000 BC, when nuts were collected almost on an industrial scale. Anyone who has a minimal comp competence with uh, toponymy knows that place names are usually motivated with much accuracy. Vegetal uh, I think it means vegetational names are one of the most common motivations, so that we cannot doubt that the island might be named that way, according to Galoni. Hey, uh, has a, uh, well, sorry, Gal Galoni has its two explanations. That was the original place name that the first settlers, who spoke a Celtic language, gave to the island. So I just need a quick drink. The descendants of those first settlers would have held the original name until today, although the motivation for such a place name, the Hazelnuts, disappeared some millennia ago. Second explanation. The island would have been so-called originally by its first settlers, speakers of an enigmatic language, and that name would have been translated into a Celtic language by the Celts themselves when they arrived at the island. Logically, Galoni uh, opts for the first option. Obviously, the second hypothesis looks highly improbable. All of this aside from the significant detail that cultural continuity is the rule in this archipelago where neither discontinuity nor intrusive elements are detected. Sorry, I'm not very good at these slides. <laughs> As a sensational archaeological discovery was presented some few years ago, this, the so-called oldest astronomical calendar of the world dated around 8,000 BC. This lunar solar time reckoner made up by means of a coherent arrangement of pits aligned from southwest to northeast. However, this was not found in China, Egypt, or Sumer, but in Scotland, Aberdeenshire. According to discoverers, Gaffney et al., hunter and gatherer communities had already a deep knowledge of time measurement in the cold lands of Scotland some 5,000 years uh, before the first calendars appeared in the warm sands of Mesopotamia. On the other hand, no man may ever doubt the astronomical function of so many megalithic monuments located in the Atlantic uh, since, uh, of, of Celtic Europe. There remains the unshakable fact that a number of our most impressive megalithic tombs were designed to relate precisely to significant solar or lunar events. Cunliffe, 2004. Again, Alinay and Bonazzo have keenly defended a Celtic origin for European megalithism. Also, Kruta has repeatedly attempted to show that historical Celts held an impressive astronomical expertise, and this now seems to be an unshakable fact. 
Basically, all these singular pieces of the puzzle can be put together in two different ways. This knowledge came from a Celtic-speaking people and passed down from generation to generation until historical times. Or, secondly, this knowledge originally came from a mysterious pre-Indo-European people who transmitted this wisdom, no one knows when and how, to Indo-European newcomers. Once again, the simplest explanation is the first one. But this option would involve putting the traditional clock for Indo-European studies back dramatically. A challenge that so far only the proponents, proponents of the so-called paradigm of Paleolithic continuity, continuitas, have seriously taken up. But maybe it's time to turn the chronological deadline and other long-held beliefs upside down. And that's the applause bit. <laughs> and thank you to Javerio.